Recording in progress. Okay, so welcome uh, to VAS Live, our monthly online network for Swindon's voluntary sector and community groups and stuff like that. Great to see you here. Thanks for joining us. And I am, of course, delighted to introduce Fiona Scott. And Fiona and I go back. It's like with these, these events, it's kind of like I use, you know, the people I know and friends with and contacts through time I've been uh, working in the area. Fiona, I go back to my last job when I was working for the, another uh, Swindon uh, Wiltshire Council uh, doing business support. And, you know, Fiona was and still is very active as a, you know, PR, I say guru, but someone who really uh, shows the local business landscape how how we can actually get covered and she's you know i think you'll, you'll tell us more about what you do as well uh, as sort of giving advice and stuff like that so fiona thanks for coming really appreciate your time and over to you oh thank you very much joel and yeah it's ages i've, I've been running my business 14 years this year so um and we met pretty much in the beginning i think joel so yeah, right, ladies, I think it's all ladies here. If it isn't, there's a, a, a chap apart from Joel in the background, apologies. Um, yeah, I've been a journalist for 34 years this year. Um, and I started my little PR business in 2008 when I was made redundant from TV. Um, because uh, I didn't want to spend my whole life in London or in Manchester, which are the two big TV hubs. Um, and I've somehow created my own dream job after losing my dream job which is fantastic so that's a bit of my background I've lived in Swindon since 1991 I've had my family here I myself um, do volunteering and um, always encourage my clients to um, support local uh, charities and local community organizations because it's good PR so I'm a huge advocate of that um, I've worked a lot with the third sector, so I work with organisations to train them how to do good PR, and on the odd occasion I will actually do it for them, though actually in the third sector it's much better to learn how to do it yourself and take it on within the team, it's more cost effective because actually good PR and marketing is very time consuming and you need to spend a lot of time on it. It's absolutely vital for the third sector. Does that make sense to anyone, uh, to everybody? Okay, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat and we'll come to them later because I'm just going to crack right on if that's all right with you. Right, okay, um, dealing with the media. The media has value today as it always has done. And I'm talking traditional media, so newspapers, magazines, radio, TV. Radio is the one that often gets forgotten, it's still hugely powerful. Um, but also the media is much broader these days, folks. It isn't just that. It can be influencers like bloggers, um, influencers with big audiences on Instagram or YouTube or many different places. Or it could be um, a brand with a huge blog reach. So I'm thinking brands like NatWest, Lloyds Bank, um, Eventbrite. There are big brands out there that actually employ journalists to write their content. So the opportunities for coverage are greater now than they've ever been. But you have to make the effort. People don't just find you. Um, don't um, fall for the mantra we often hear in business and only recently, sadly, at the BAFTAs, Kenneth Branagh said it. Um, build it and they will come. They won't bloody come. OK, you have to make them come. And you have to keep showing up, OK, because um, if you think about, I mean, I'm in my 50s now, but if I think about my children, my oldest is 28, think of all the messages they receive every day um, across social media, through the Internet, through traditional broadcasting. You have to shout to be heard. And if you don't shout about what you're doing, whether it's personally or within your organisation or within your business, how do you expect people just to rock up and find you? It's not going to be enough to drive a business forward and to make it visible. So you have to do stuff. And when you do stuff, you need to talk about it. And the media want to hear about you, but in certain circumstances. So if I tell you how the media works, just roughly, that should help you to start to plan some stories. So, OK, 
I'm going to talk to you first. The best way of doing it is to say that the media, so if you take something like the Swindon Advertiser, for example, the Gazette and Herald, or BBC Wiltshire, has a huge historic audience. It has a bigger audience than you are ever going to have. And that has been built over decades, okay? Over decades, even hundreds of years in some cases. And also aligned to that, they will have an online presence naturally by what they do, which is much bigger than yours. So they improve your reach, the amount of people you can reach. And if you are savvy with them, you can get them to cover stories about you and your organization free of charge if you meet their needs. OK, that is the value of them. And remember, these days, if the Swindon Advertiser runs a story about Fiona Scott and Scott Media and I've got an online link, I can link, link that I can share, I am amplifying that reach myself across my own circles of influence. And every other person who shares that story is also doing that. So it means we all become powerful for our own messages. So that's the value of the media. Um, and on the national media, even greater, international media, even greater still. But once you understand that, don't be afraid of it because journalists are looking for stories, okay? Then that's what they're looking for. So what do journalists not like? Products or services, okay? So if you want to just continually talk about what you do over and over and over again without any change, without any variety, it's boring. You wouldn't go on social media and just do the same post over and over and over again, would you, Amy's of this world? No, you wouldn't. It's boring. It's boring for you and it's boring for anybody to read it. So if you want to bang on about, you know, the 20 great things your organisation does and that's all you want to focus on, you're going to have to take advertising space to sustain that with the media. OK, you've got to be more savvy than that. You've got to be able to identify stories within your organisation. OK. The media don't do well with mission statements. So mission statements is something that comes up a lot in the charitable sector. Um, also comes up a lot in business. So in business, when I'm out about networking, I'll often hear this kind of statement. My role and job is to empower and enrich the lives of women in their 50s going through menopause. And afterwards you think, yeah, that's a great mission statement, but what do you actually do? How do you achieve that? Well, you know, it's good to have a mission statement and it's good. That might be a nice quote within a story. But for a journalist, it's like a mm, bit wishy-washy that, a bit fluffy. I don't actually know what you do. And what happens at a business event when you say that is people will often look at you and then they're too embarrassed to come up and actually later and say, I'm really sorry, I didn't really get what you do. I know that you want to achieve this, but they'll, they'll just fudge the issue or not bother to talk to you because they were slightly embarrassed okay you need to say what you do really clearly so in business it might be i sell skincare products i make t-shirts i offer pr publicity services which look to empower the lives of women or whatever it is does that make sense to everyone just don't talk about mission statements you must say what your organization does or what you do don't lose yourself in fluffery where people can't understand. And if you find that you're continually having to explain what you do, then that's because you've got lost in mission speak, mission creep. Nobody understands it. OK, the other thing is delusion. So how do I explain this? In business, what I mean with this is the person that thinks they are the dogs you know what, and they bang on and on about it all the time. When you see them, they always say the same thing till you feel battered with their story. And you think, oh no, it's that person who's banging on about the same thing again and again. Okay, that's delusion. That is thinking your story is the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, and it's not. There is always going to be someone who is more successful than you, better at what you do. So you have to have some humility around your mission and around where you sit in the landscape in which your organisation is based. However, there's another side of delusion, which I actually see far more often, and it's this. Oh, what I do, it, it's pretty dull. It's quite boring. Um, you know, it's the dull but worthy stuff that has to be done. Usually I'll hear that from accountants or lawyers or someone in the financial sector. That is equally deluded. 
okay equally deluded everyone has a story everyone has something to share every organization has multiple short stories to share so um you can you can be deluded either ends of the scale so don't use it as an excuse not to tell a story because you think what you do is necessary but boring um no 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 both of those are deluded the other thing is poor research. Now, often when you work with PR companies, so those of you who might work from an organization that works with someone like me, there are certain red flags, okay? And one is poor research. So many PR companies use a database to make their lives easier, sending a story out to the media. But when you do that, you're probably sending it to 400 journalists, 395 of which are never gonna be interested. And that's called poor research. It's much better with the media to have a small media list where you've done your research and you know they're interested in what you do, the type of story you can offer. So putting it simply, if you are at Ipsum in Swindon and you've taken on a Kickstarter or an apprentice, the Cumbria Evening News do not want to hear about that. But if you are send, using a provider who sends it out through a database and it goes to every newsroom in the country, you're actually spamming journalists. And think to yourself this, how much do you like to be spammed? You don't like it. And the thing is, the effect it has is you might, Ipsum, for example, decide you're going to open an office or start delivering your service in Cumbria. But next time the journalist receives a press release from you, they're going to delete it before they've even opened it. So it's really about targeted media list. You know, horse and hounds are not interested in your cat or your rabbit. OK, they're interested in horse and hounds. So, you know, smaller media lists. Don't try and be all things to everybody. Be something to a select few. And this is particularly true of the national press. OK, particularly true of them. And the other thing is journalists are not interested in how busy you are or how packed your diary is. OK, a journalist operates on daily or weekly deadlines and sometimes hourly deadlines. So if you say if a journalist approaches you and says, I need to talk to you today because I want to talk to you about a successful third sector organisation or charity or CIC based in Swindon and I need to talk to you now. And you say, actually, I'm really busy. Can we talk on Wednesday at 2 p.m.? Forget it. That journalist is moving along to the next person who finds time. Now, it is possible. I often have this in businesses and organisations where they think, well, journalists should be understand we're really busy. Now, you need to understand that most journalists are freelance and they have a finite period of time in which to find that voice. If BBC Wiltshire, which came to me yesterday for a client, wants to speak to you at three o'clock on a Wednesday and you're going to be on Drive Time, James Thomas show, which is the biggest audience. And you say, oh, I can't do that time. Can you do it on next Monday at two? They're going to say no. And not only that, they're going to say no, they're never going to come back because what they've learned is you can't meet their need. So if you want the media to be part of you, you are going to have to flex for the media. Um, my clients that I work with, I'm working with a um, community organisation in Malmesbury at the moment. And BBC Wiltshire want to interview them about an event this Saturday. The time BBC Wiltshire gave was three o'clock on Wednesday. And the person they want to interview has changed everything that they were planning to do to be there at three o'clock on Wednesday because they understand that the audience of BBC Wiltshire is huge. Their event is Saturday, so they've got a small window of opportunity to get people through the door to their event. OK, so you when you access a bigger audience, you need to jump when they say jump and you need to say how high do I need to jump because if you do that guess what I know you'll do it and what will they do they'll be back the next time a story comes up because stories come in cycles they go round and round okay so I'm just going to recap five things journalists hate talking about products and services that's advertising mission statements that don't actually tell you anything concrete about what you do OK, mission statement is a quote. Rule of thumb, mission statement is the quote. Delusion. Don't think you're the best thing since sliced bread, but equally don't think you have nothing to say. Poor research. Don't send your story absolutely everywhere if it's not suitable. And diary. They don't care how busy you are because their deadlines are more important. Anyone got any questions around those? 
Joel, you're, you're laughing at me. <laughs> I'm loving wow. it. I'm loving it. <laughs> okay, let's move on to things that journalists love. Would that be useful to everyone? Okay, here we go. Right story, right time. Okay, they love people who can predict and who can contact them in advance, okay, of something breaking. And a li handy little tool for any of you for this is one of these. Okay, I like the old fashioned diaries. Okay, this is a social media diary. In here are all the awareness days coming up, as you can see. I know it's backwards, April 2022. Okay, so someone like me goes through this and I can flag up to local journalists every single month who I'm working with in the area who can talk about these things. Can you do that? Can you do that for your organization? So I'm gonna just throw a few things. I don't know about a lot about what you do, so I'm guessing, okay? Um, I'll tell you where I got it from. I can share a link later if you want, Amy, for that. Um, okay, April Fool's Day, okay? Fun, if you wanna say something fun or you're doing something fun that's fun and not poking fun at somebody on April Fool's Day, tell the media about it the day before under embargo we're going to be doing this it might make a nice picture because they're looking for stuff for april fool's day in fact i'd probably tell them today or tomorrow but you can put it under an embargo an embargo is a contract of respect between an organization and a journalist which says we're telling you about this now please do not use it before this time which would be one minute past midnight on April the 1st, okay? So you are flagging up to the media. This works particularly well with radio and TV because you're giving them time to plan content, okay? And to plan in advance. It's also Stress Awareness Month in April, okay? So you can use that to contact, if you're doing something visual, if you're doing an event around stress or helping people through stress, um, and um, that event is open and public, I would be now or in the first week of April, depending on the date, contacting local radio and TV. I did that, you know, I'm doing this event. It's pegged to Stress Awareness Month in April. Peg, that's what's called the hook. That's the top good reason for doing it at this time. Would you be interested in writing about or attending this event? Don't get upset if journalists don't attend, folks because sometimes they'll still cover it anyway, just because they know it's happening. Uh, what else is coming up? I'm just going to run through April for you. Uh, National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Now, there could be somebody in the room today or that's watching this on replay that works with children who suffered trauma for abuse or adults who suffered trauma for abuse. This is a good way of I mean, obviously, you've got to protect people's identity and there are safeguarding issues there. We get that and journalists get that, too. And they understand that. But you could shed, share a story of some anonymous person or some work you've been doing as an organisation or an impact statement or a survey. Um, this is this is where you can contact the media proactively and say, um, as April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month, would you be interested in a story about how we've helped, I don't know, 20 young people over the last year? Here's a quote from one of them anonymously. It could say something like Fiona, aged 18, not her real name. You know, the media will expect that in a sensitive situation like this. Um, other things, sometimes there's something fun going on. National Walking Day on the 6th, for example, you could share your favourite walks if that is relevant. Um, World Homeopathy Awareness Week, 10th to the 16th of April. Every single month, there is something where you can hook on a reason to contact the media. Um, just align it to your organization's goals and values and the experience of those within your organization. So, for instance, MS Awareness Week, the 18th to the 24th of April, one of my clients um, has a small publishing company. She's not based in Swindon. She's in Lincolnshire. She has MS. So during that week, well, in fact, the week before, I'll offer her up as a case study to the media, particularly the national media. If the national media are looking for case studies, um, and she'll share some of her journey with MS and what that means to her, because it will look different for everybody. And she'll do blogs during that week or and social media stuff to drive people to the blogs, which drives people to the website, which lifts the website up on Google. So I know I'm throwing at this really quickly, but this is about right story, right time. 
There are other points in the year that you can predict things are going to happen and the media will be talking about. Some really simple ones, Easter, Christmas, Halloween. You know, if any of those are relevant to your organisation or you see an uplift in interest at this time. So a classic one is Christmas and domestic violence, for example. Uh, domestic violence stats will often go up over the Christmas period, as they do, funnily enough, around big football matches and as they did massively during the pandemic. So you can use the hook of Christmas to talk about the thing you want to talk about because it's relevant at that time. Is that making sense to everyone? Right story, right time, proactively let the media know you're doing something. Okay, but you can also use something else with the media and it's called newsjacking. So when a big story breaks on an issue and you can talk about that issue, rather than the individuals involved, you can do what's called newsjacking. And you can, so a real classic example, I don't know if any of you thought of it yesterday, anger management and the Oscars, Will Smith, Chris Rock. Okay. Now, if you are dealing in anger management or uh, mediation or something like that, and you did a blog yesterday and you put it out on social media, add in the hashtag journal request, you are immediately visible to journalists who are writing about that. It doesn't mean you have to make personal comments about Will Smith or Chris Rock. Let's face it, I doubt any of you in the room personally know them or know their situation. But when you're on a public stage like that, a, a, an incident like that will have massive repercussions, massive repercussions, both for them personally and others. Another one recently might have been the P&O situation. So if you were in HR or you were dealing with, you know, how to treat your employees ethically or not, as the case may be, you might take that as a case study and express your opinion on it. Right. I've noticed a question come through. Gonya, how often um, should you do this so you don't flood your social media? Gosh, that's a hard question to answer, Amy. Um, but I think that you should never trust your gut on it. But also, always remember, only a very small percentage of your audience is online at any one time. So you actually you can't overdo it, to be honest. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm around a lot. If you follow me on social media, which I'll encourage you all to do, um, there'll be times when you think oh god Fiona's banging on about that thing again but you always have to remember that I'm running my own business and I have to be visible you are acting for your organization and for the good of your organization you have to be visible so uh, what I say the rule of thumb is this if you are sharing with good intent okay with good intent to inspire and encourage and improve and to care then you share as much as you like, fill your boots. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so right, right. Sorry, go on. Yeah, that yes. helps. It's just um, sometimes I get asked why we don't get like as much likes and as many reshares. And I'm like trying to explain it isn't always just about that. This about getting it out there. And that's one of the things I'm sort of worrying and wondering about. Is, okay, like, well, that is a technical thing. And you, um, um, if you're worried about that, that they're asking you, honestly, that is such a daft question to ask. Mm. How can you control what audience is online at any one time? How can yeah. they control that? The only way you can do that is do a little bit of data mining around uh, over the last month, which posts at which time of day have got the most posts and looking to see if you can see any patterns and then post at that time. But you need to keep an eye on that. The, the, and also you are at the mercy of Facebook, Instagram, all of their algorithms changing and Google's changing over which you have zero control. So the only way around that is consistency. Mm -hmm. Keep showing up, okay? Because that's the only thing you can control. Um, how often would you repost the same content? Um, oh gosh, generally what I do is repost once a year because the same subjects keep coming up, but try and make a new headline. Every year there's something different. So uh, you, I write blogs for clients and Easter is something that comes up every year. And we always write about Easter. So there might be something new, a new angle at Easter for you. Just try and top and tail it slightly different. Um, top it so it's, it's clear it's this year's Easter. 
and the call to action at the end might be different because your organization might have moved on might have different priorities might be fundraising for a particular project or um you know where do you want to drive people to because you have to think this way how often do you go onto scott media's website and look back at a blog a year ago yeah you don't do you or look at a newspaper a year ago unless you're doing research for a very particular focused purpose so um we were always taught this in newspapers when i first started is that there isn't really a new story out there anyway you're simply retelling stories as you go new ideas are very rare so um now sonia you asked me a question is it better to write the story for the media I think the swindon advertiser would prefer this oh i can answer that question quite easily uh, when i was business editor of the swindon advertiser back in the um early 1990s we had 15 reporters covering the whole of swindon which had a population of about 180,000. today swindon has a population of around what 220,000, and they've got five reporters so I think I'm answering your question. Uh, the journalist in me is like, oh, that's not great. Nothing gets checked over. But the easier you make it for the media to um, write your story, the more likely they're going to use the story. And also it's you controlling the message. So there's two things to consider there. You're, so make it as easy as you can for them. So write story, write time, write audience. So quite, quite often when I get when I do a lot of writing for Total Guide, uh, online digital news service in Swindon, and also for the Business Exchange, which is our only decent business to business magazine in um, Swindon and Wiltshire, and that's every two months, I write for them. Um, I get sent press releases for that every day. You will be amazed how many of them are totally, um, I delete them. Um, I really, really delete them. This is what I said to you about sending people to the right audience. Do you know how many Swindon businesses will send me a story and they don't even mention the word Swindon in their press release? Or add their contact details, or they'll send me a whole news release about their event and not actually tell me when the event takes place. Now, the truth is, um, I do have time with these outlets to go back and say, can you tell me when your interesting event is taking place? And they think, oh, but you know, you've got to make sure the basic structural information is there. OK, if they want to ask you a question. So if you've sent me a news release about your event and you haven't put when the event is, you haven't included a contact detail. Am I going to search around the Internet to find out the contact details for you when I'm really, really busy? No, I'm not. That's the reality. I'm not going to do it. And if I'm one of five reporters on the Swindon advert and today I've been given 10 tasks to do and, and I look at yours and I think, well, there's no contact details. I'll get back to that. I won't get back to it. I won't. So you've got to make sure basic information is there. Right. Really, really important for the media pictures good pictures and i am talking professional images that you have paid for too much in the third sector in the voluntary sector we expect the media to take a rubbish image you've taken with your smartphone that's portrait it's dark we can't see your face now you might get away with that on social media but you are not going to keep getting away with that with the media your smartphone is not good enough unless it's a real in the moment thing. And I'll give you an example of what that might be. I've got a client who's at the, um, some big fancy Bamington horse trials and they've got a stand selling their stuff. Um, and it costs a fortune to be there selling your stuff. Now, it's highly likely that a celebrity will walk by at an event like that and you might say oh hey whoever it is like david beckham can we have a picture with you and you quickly take it with your phone will the media use that yes they will because it's unusual and it's quirky but a picture of you and your team dark where you're all looking different ways on your iphone done in a portrait no they're not going to a good picture is absolutely key if you've got limited budget to spend spend it on that so good headshots, good team images, 
um, good images of the key moments in your year where you really want to get the word out there. And if you look at the bigger organisations in the third sector, you will see they plan for professional photography around their PR plan. So uh, headshots of the chief executive, headshot of the leadership team, headshot of any ambassadors or patrons that can be thrown out at a moment's notice with a story. Even me, I mean, I run a micro business, you know, a, 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 in the terms of business, a really small business. I have headshots done at least once a year. I have professional images done of every single event that I run because I want people to book on the next event. I want to look good. I want to show up properly. I dye my hair a lot, so I have to have photographs taken a lot. But, um, you know, don't rely on images taken. Also, the other thing that comes up in the third sector a lot is they'll say things like, oh, I appeared in the advert about three months ago. You can use that picture. No, that picture belongs to the advert. She so can't use it anywhere else. The copyright isn't yours. Um, and the other thing I'll, I'll just take it off my Facebook. The resolution's rubbish. You can't just take it off your Facebook, it's tiny. So you're saying to that newspaper, use this rubbish picture and you'll have to use it this size instead of sending a decent one, which they can blow up to fill the space. So if you follow me on social media, you're gonna see with the clients I work with routinely, beautiful pictures. And you're gonna look, look at them and think, oh, I get it now because Fiona's maximizing the opportunity that those journalists, you know, if they've got space to fill and they're lacking a story, they'll blow that picture up. And my clients get more coverage, yeah. Ooh. So, you know, you don't have to spend a fortune on this. And I'm not gonna to talk to you about costs, that's a question for another day, but invest in very good imagery strategically. Um, some photographers now will offer you an annual package. So you pay an amount, and they will do like three photo shoots for you throughout a year. And you can even negotiate with them to pay that monthly to help with cash flow. And I would strongly recommend you do that. So you've got to show up professionally. Don't expect people to spend money with you if you're not prepared to spend money on yourself or your organization. Always looking for stuff on the cheap or free. Just spend your money wisely. And another thing that's coming, and it will come even more, is video. Video is increasingly important. Any of you who will work on social media will know that a video post will get more traction. Even if you're doing it, um, uh, you know, cheaply and you're editing it yourself using free software. But also Google with its algorithm and its uh, greater use of AI. I've just written an article for a client on Google's changes this year. They are going to rank video highly from this year. Rank Brain, their AI, is going through a note in video. Now, unless you can afford to splurge loads of money on Google Ads, these are the tools you need to use to rank highly on video. Good content, good imagery, good video. Okay, so um, start doing video. Is there a message that you can do in video form? Get comfortable with video, get comfortable in front of your phone, get comfortable in front of your iPad, get comfortable in front of a camera, an amateur camera or a broadcast quality camera. Squeeze those opportunities. And when you contact the media, if you've got a relevant video that's relevant to the story, put the link in the editor's notes at the bottom. So I'll give you an example. I'm about to send out a link for a client who's fundraising for the RNLI. Um, they're doing it for a very personal reason. And if you go onto the Just Giving page, which um, I will share when the media goes out in a couple of days, um, there is a video telling the story of that reason why they're fundraising. That video will probably raise the money on its own. And the reason video is so powerful, as TV is so powerful, is if you've ever done any kind of psychology around how we receive information and how we react to it, um, words are something like 70%. Body language and tone of voice is the rest. And video hits all of those three at once. We read information, we receive emotion, visually mostly, and video hits all of those at once. And that's why it's such a powerful medium. That's why YouTube is so powerful and it's the second most search engine on the internet. And it's why we have a thing called YouTubers and influencers on YouTube who make a lot of money 
either from having free product and being paid to do stuff or and or from YouTube paying them themselves because they're influencers on their own right. And YouTube starts paying you from 1000 subscribers. So pictures and video really help a journalist get to know you and encourages them to use your stuff. And the next thing I want you to think deadlines, I've alluded to it before. When you talk to a journalist and they come to you, um, you need to be able to ask them in the question two or three needs to be, what's your deadline? OK, what's your deadline? And then you work to that deadline, set yourself a deadline a little bit earlier and work to it and deliver on time because you if you deliver to their deadline and you understand their needs they're going to come back to you and that's the key thing to remember trust the process if you know their deadline is in an hour's time and you are going to be in a sensitive meeting with a service user who needs your support that's fine just say to them i'm so sorry i'm not going to be able to meet that deadline but joel rose such and such can do that for you and give them somebody else they can contact because the journalist is the same outcome. They will remember that you helped them meet that deadline, even if you personally can't meet it. So always have two or three strategic partners in your sector that you can bump that offer onto. So you will find if someone comes to me and says, oh, Fiona, can you talk about um, image image if someone came to me today what you think about the whole will smith and chris rock thing and i'm on a talk with you right now i would have said do you know i can't talk about that but my client taz can here's a number here's her email and the journalist is happy because they just want to fulfill their story and to fulfill their deadline and the final thing ladies and gents to talk about is if you take nothing else away from talking, me talking today it is this. Journalists are interested first and foremost in people, okay? In people and people stories. And there isn't a business or organization in the land that doesn't have people somewhere along the line. Now I have been and given talks, I gave a talk in London to about 200 small business starters. And I did ask the question, I said, right, hands up anyone in the room who hasn't got people in their business and about 10 people put their hands up. And the reason they did is because they were thinking their business was digital and online and therefore it wasn't a people business until I pointed out to them that they are the people in their business. Um, so people stories always, we want people stories. So when you want to talk about what you're doing as a charity or an organization, you need to think, what is the human face I can put on this story? So if you want to launch, I've got I've got another client who's launching a new service in a couple of months or time. Launching a new service is not a story, but the person who is launching that new service is a story. If that makes sense, so there's going to be beautiful pictures of this person who is launching this new part of the business. The story is going to be about them. And I 100% guarantee you I will get coverage for her. When actually the story is launched, you've got to be smart, folks. You've got to put a human face on things. And I'm not really saying anything you don't already know if you're doing social media. You're just doing it in smaller chunks, that's all. Right, okay, that's enough of me. Let me just answer this question. How often do you, uh, should your headsets be on a plain background or in your environment? Like how corporate should it look? Um, uh, oh, hardly ever on a plain background. I mean, don't you find those dull to look at? Yeah, you need a range of images. And if you, it depends really, how are the images going to be used? So if it's on your website and you all want to look fairly standard and you all want it in a particular style, that's fine but quite boring for the media. Generally for the media, um, you need to think mm, a range of images. So what I do when I get a new client, so let's just say I was working with Joel, okay, and we were doing a photo shoot, I get Joel to give me five words to describe himself. So five words to describe your organization. And I'm thinking words of emotion with that. So it might be friendly, approachable, dynamic, and it, you know, just think of five words and then you need images that match that. It might be serious. So someone like me, sometimes I'm asked to um, talk about quite serious issues. So I need I need a headshot that I can use that matches the story. 
So that's quite a good way of doing it. But generally, I wouldn't do plain background. Also, don't do a headshot that struggles to get in. This is a common one, the logo or the banner. It looks crap. It just does. It looks awful. And you end up with some weird word coming out your ear. It's always better to see people's faces first. Don't try and make it ridiculous to get a long logo in. You get the chance to say who you are and where you're from within the context of the story. Um, the amount of times, I mean, some businesses, when I write for the business exchange, they'll do a story about moving into a premises and, and, and the, the picture they send me is of a building. And I just, I'm not going to use a picture of a random building. Here's the building this new business has moved into. Yeah, it's boring. It doesn't make any sense. I want the people that are going to be within that building. You know, um, just be a little bit creative about it. Um, think of the shots that you look at and are boring. There are some exceptions, though. OK, white or plain background. If you are a person who is likely to get national coverage and you need some advice around this. So I work with a nutritional therapist. We get loads of national coverage for her. The type of um, story that she's likely to be in is what we call um, listicles or features. And mag basically in magazines like Platinum, The Lady, Women's Weekly, those type of magazines, which I deal with a lot. So in those cases, they want to design a page with a number of pictures on. So in that case, they will want a transparent or a white or gray background. So it really is dependent. And also if you're selling product, they will want what's called cutouts. And that is a white or transparent background of the product. And that's a particular type of photography for a particular type of outcome. But generally, no, I'd always go for something that's more natural, where you feature heavily in an environment that makes sense with what you do. I remember, Joel, you did some really nice pictures for your music, didn't you? around by wh where I live with graffiti in the background. That made sense, absolutely. Even though it took me a while to work out who this weirdo was hanging around my graffiti building, but that completely made sense. So um, is that helpful to you? So come on and let's open it up to a few questions. Who's got a story they'd like to tell and they want to run past me? Just to quickly say, Fiona, fantastic. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. So yes, over to who, who wants to run a story past Fiona? Um, I don't mind <laughs> going. Um, so we've got a um, event coming up mm -hmm. and so we've been pushing it like how we can and it's still not like enough. <laughs> so just trying to sort of do it with that. We've had it put in um, the Link magazine and it's been everywhere. We've still got 23 tickets to sell for it, but it's how mm -hmm. to keep that going. When is the event? Uh, the event is on the 21st of May. And it's a Gary and Robbie tribute night at the Devere Cotswold. And it's to raise funds for Ipsum and like a night out with. OK, fun right. Night night, yeah. uh, what that tells me, Amy, is that nobody in your organisation is planning stories properly around events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should be able to shift those really quick. So, OK, with an event, always plan for at least two or three stories around that event. OK, so the first story is is coming up with a nice picture. So it might be around the um, whoever's organizing the event, a nice picture of the CEO, for example, um, to say this event is coming up and here's how you can book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would be getting that out this week. Then I'd like two weeks elapse. And then I'd say, right, what's the next story? Oh, our headline act is with a few quotes from the headline act, get them to send you a decent picture that they can use, send it out again, two stories. OK, and then a third story, because presumably it's not the only event you're going to hold. You're going to hold other fundraising events. So I do a story about here we are having great fun at our event. And then you use that as an excuse to push your next event. So the call to action is and in um, July this year, we're going to be running another event on blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Find out more here. And as soon as they find out more here, it's do you want to book? Okay, so where they land, where your call to action at the end of the press release sends them somewhere you want them to go. And when they go there, you've got to show them the till, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so event should have at least two or three stories. Okay. And how often are you putting it on social media? So um, 
I was asked to pin it to the top of the pages so it's pinned on the top of the Facebook stuff but that's what came from them but I don't feel that you can works. pin it yeah. you can pin it that's fine to meet their needs yeah okay but no you've got to you've got to share you've got to keep sharing it and reminding people you can do it as a countdown oh today it's two months to our next event would you like to come along mm -hmm. um and I would be sharing it at least twice a week if not more okay you will find when I've got an event to fill, I will share, I will get my um, social media manager to share across my social media every two hours. Okay. Now, some people do get hacked off and occasionally I'll get a message and I always respond with this. I say, I'm running my own business. You can feel free to unfollow me. And they'll usually only say that once. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, when we say, when we think, oh, it's too much, we're doing that too often, we are projecting our own assumption of what's too often onto other people what you also have to remember is the majority of your audience won't have seen that previous 10 posts yeah so you're always posting with the person who hasn't seen it yet in mind and also uh, uh, to um with you what i would be doing is thinking right what type of person might be go to this event so it might be ipsum followers um, that already follow you and are already in a circle, people that love music, people that want a night out, um, people that want a night out that raises money for charity. And I would just write a list of, right, who's the type of person who's going to invest in this event? And a post might say, are you a music lover? Do you love da-da-da type of music? Why not come along too? Um, have you supported Ipsum in the past? Would you like to support us again? You know, have you heard of Ipsum? We support people like this. How about coming to find us at this event? Can you see us saying the same thing over and over again in a different yeah. way? Is that helpful, Amy? Yeah, it's really helpful. I think the only thing I keep getting frustrated about with the social media stuff and the sharing stuff is that if I have shared something again, that it's like an obsession with likes. It's like, why are you not getting enough likes? And I, I'm trying to convey that to them that it isn't about this more than that it's yeah it's 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 i mean yes it's great but likes mm -hmm. don't convert into sales anyway mm -hmm. it's about reach and it's about being consistent i've got a group on facebook called fiona scott's pr tribe i think you're already in it aren't you joel yeah um you can all apply to join fiona scott's pr tribe you will be asked some questions and i do sell my stuff in there i make no bones about it but i do share loads of tips uh, loads of tips and things coming up and things to talk about as well as my own stuff so you can pick out the bones out of it for what you want to and equally events like that it's fine to sell uh, if you know if you're in the Swindon or Wiltshire area would you mind sharing this link about my event and some will you only need four or five people to share and you are immediately accessing hundreds of people OK, because we all have on average three to four hundred connections on Facebook alone. I mean, I'm just one of those people that's got, you know, nearly the end of how many people I can actually connect with. But, um, you know, people are powerful. Ask them to help you. And the one advantage you have being in the third sector, if you're a community interest company or a charity, is that the local media are very minded to run your stories. They don't actually want to hear from you every day, though. Um, Right, come on, come on, other Amy, Amy Ford, come on. What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> um, Who do you work with, Amy? Smash. We haven't got a social media. We're in the process of it's something that we're looking to get up and running. So um, yeah, it's just I was just coming on, just mainly sort of tips and and tricks, really. What but do yeah, you so do? so we mentor. Um, young people so from 16 to 19 um we, who are neat um yeah, so yeah. Not, yeah so we so I, I we want to start doing a lot more social media i think we're just updating our um website um and we've um andy our um ceo has mentioned instagram and things like that so it's something we're working on um but it's just i suppose it's reaching out we connecting to the young people and and sort of how we'd connect with them really Okay, 16 to 19, you're probably talking well, Instagram. I'm, I, I'm my daughter's 20. So for her, it tends to be Instagram and Snapchat are the two that she will use. 
routinely every day and then um facebook simply because it's the biggest but they'll dip in and out of that i think the facebook yeah. age demographic is something like 35 to 44 is the average age demographic so um but what i would say to you is get really consistent on one don't try and be all things to everybody else you'll keep falling over get really consistent on one and then layer another one on top when you've got uh but good luck. I'll look forward to seeing your staff. But it's Anyone a brand new team. So. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying it's a brand new team. So it's all kind of just starting mm. again kind of thing. But OK, Sonia, do you want to ask anything? Um, yeah. Um, how do we how do we access national press? Um, you know, I mean, it was it was I, I put in some a small article in the Spin Advertiser, wrote it myself. Um, and sent it in and that worked but trying to sort of negotiate the website to find out who you need to get in touch with but also if we've got a big story that we quite like because we're, we're affiliated to a national um, mm -hmm. charity yeah um, so do I do I just go through the national charity because we're all kind of we run like a franchise almost so yeah. we're completely independent but um we do have a, a headway news, which is which is um, created by our our sort of head office national charity. But um, we've we've just done a um, brain injury cookbook because we work with adults who've ex who've experienced brain injury. Yeah. Um, so I created um, using lottery money a, a cookbook that was specific to people who would struggle to process, etc. And um, our board of our, on our board of trustees, we have a couple of solicitors who offered their services for, to get in touch with the press. Yeah. And it just fell flat on its face and we have no press coverage at all. Right. Um, which okay. was really disappointing. Even local okay. press, there was nothing. Okay. A, a new book is published every three seconds. That is the world you're entering with a book. So with national press with books, they are two years in advance. They are sent out, um, authors proofs two years in advance to even have a scooby chance of your book being covered or reviewed at national level. People often make this mistake of publishing their book first and then trying to get national coverage and that will hardly ever work. I'm surprised local haven't covered it. Yeah, says, I mean, basically we were having a launch, it was lockdown, so we weren't yeah. expecting like masses of people, but we just wanted it in the paper to raise awareness of our service mm. as well and mm. then if people want i mean we're not looking to make a profit or anything we're just um just out there to show people oh look look what we've done this is a great product i mean i've been told it's really good by by a lot of professionals um we're not after it being on the shelf anywhere it was just to raise awareness of yeah um, of, of our service really um and and just to get that press coverage for the day just to say oh, you know, we've got this launch and if anybody was interested in buying a book, you know, just get in touch with us, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And we had nothing. And I had left it up to the solicitor's firm, to their, their sort of PR people to um, to cover that and, and write a story. But And did they? Did anything go out? Do you know? Did they actually well, do it? That's the first thing I would exactly. ask. Exactly. I don't know because I don't know who they contacted. That, that I was given a copy of what they'd written, but other than that, I don't know if it did, but then when I wrote something recently to go in the paper, it went in. Yeah, so, I think I would be amazed if over a period of time they wouldn't have covered that locally with a decent picture. But what I would say to you is this, there are a few places you can hang out for free to get the opportunity to be in the national press. But with the national press, the thing you have to remember is you cannot push upon them a story that you think is exciting and deserves national coverage no, that is not got to be the mindset. The mindset is, can I meet their need? OK, can I meet their need? So two places. Just so if you had written a blog, if you write a blog post tomorrow about why I did, why I um, wrote this book or why I put together this book, your motivation for doing it, Sonia, you write a blog about that with a link to the book within the blog and you put it on Twitter with the hashtag journal request. It could be picked up tomorrow because journalists hang out on Twitter. OK. OK, they hang out on Twitter and the hashtag is journal request. So you can use that as a search term. Use it as a search at the top when it come um, and click latest. And you will see journalists from all over the world, bloggers and influencers asking for stuff.
Now, some of it is going to be rubbish and completely irrelevant to you. That's fine. Um, but you will find stuff. If you follow me, I share loads of these almost on a daily basis. And I will tag, if I know people that fit that brief, I will tag them in it. And my okay. rule of thumb is this, clients who are paying me get first dibs. Everyone else I will tag. Okay, um, the other place on Facebook, there's a really good group you can join. Any of you can join, male or female, it's called Feature Me! Exclamation mark UK. Feature Me! Exclamation mark UK. It's run by a group of female national freelance journalists most national journalists are freelance they work across tv radio and written press it's heavily towards what we would have called the red tops or the tabloid press so if that's not what you're interested in it's probably not the group for you um, and you cannot post in that group but journalists say what they're looking for in that group so if you fit that bill or someone within your organization fits the bill. So um, if, for example, they said, um, we're looking to talk to anyone who has published a book in the last two years. Um, please email us with details. You're going to fit that bill, aren't you? Mm. You're going to send as, and respond to that. Uh, you've then met their need. The okay. thing about this is it's going to meet their agenda, not yours. Yeah. Um, but if you follow a group like that, and they, they don't post every day, there are probably three or four requests from these journalist feature writers a week. But the truth is, they write a lot for, I've had Guardian, Women's Weekly, Platinum, The Lady, ITV This Morning, Good Morning Britain, all through that group, because I have put forward people at the right time for the right thing. So if you are consistently engaging with the media and you look in that group, there's got you'll get at least one opportunity a year where you or someone in your organization fits the criteria. And, and it can be bonkers stuff. I mean, it could be, oh, um, I had a client in Metro recently talking about, it was about um, menopause. Um, I, I'm in my 50s, so I'm coming out the other end now. Um, but one of my clients is, and I pitched her because I thought, well, she can talk about menopause. She's married to a woman. Um, she lives in Lincolnshire. And they're, they're in this unusual situation of two women going through menopause together, which none of us would never think of, probably, unless we are a gay couple. And that's fine. And, and it went everywhere. Just a simple thing. Now, these are people that run business from their homes. You meet the journalist's need and you exactly hit that need and you are articulate and able to share your opinion in an articulate way quickly. Suddenly you find you're in the Daily Mail. And do you know how much it costs to be a mail online on their homepage? £25,000 a day. Yeah. A day. So, you know, there are ways of doing this and engaging with the media and starting to learn what the media is looking for. The more you learn organically by following in these certain ways that I suggested to you sooner or later it is inevitable that you will fit mm. um I got on the big hairy podcast with someone who used to be on telly a long time ago just because I dye my hair now that has nothing to do with my business but I still get to mention it and the reason is this so who are you Fiona Scott and what do you do oh well I run Scott Media I'm a media consultant I they are going to talk about what you do yeah. And then they'll get to the meat of the story, the conversation. So remember, the story is you and all your experiences and that of the people in your business. But obviously the give back, the housekeeping bit is you mentioning who you are and what you do. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, that's OK. I'm conscious we've gone a bit over time. Sorry, Joel. Yeah, we better. No, I, I mean, I'm so happy I've been recording this. I mean, I, I know it's run out of time, but I want to ask a yeah. very specific question, please. And and. So we've got Mental Health Awareness Week coming coming up in the 9th to 13th of May. And I take your point that, um, you know, press release, put it on embargo a couple of days before. So it's ready to hit maybe on the Monday. But I'm wondering if I do that and send it uh, in the middle of the week, embargo for the Monday, shall I send another one on the day before or on the Monday or, or, in case the initial embargoed one has got covered or is that spamming? No, I I think that trust your judgment. But a fun just to help you with that, I pitched a client for Mental Health Awareness Week this week 
to ITV in her area. So I would be, if I was you, I'd be emailing Points West for TV coverage, which doesn't come often for most of us, um, TV coverage now and say Mental Health Awareness Week is coming up. Are you doing anything on it? We've got a couple of case studies that are, and just a summary of each one. If you're interested, please let me know. And because what they're thinking of is, is, can I build a visual sequence with that person? Hmm. And mental health awareness can be a tricky subject because people don't often don't want to be named. So you've got to paint a picture of how they can cover that story visually. So Points West now, BBC Wiltshire the week before, and I would say probably the week before um, the other media as well. Um, definitely, definitely good, strong case studies identified with a picture if you can. If the story is strong enough and someone needs to be anonymous, a picture that is anonymous that they can use. And the, pe the newspapers, like the advert just a day yeah. or two before. I would do a week before for them. Uh, just to let them know it's coming up. Don't assume that the press have something as simple as a social media diary, because usually they don't. So you, would, if I did it a week before for the advert, you wouldn't. I wouldn't do something close to the time with the more detail. I, I would. I might send a personal email. So if you were to send it to a specific reporter who's your contact, I don't know, Dan Wood or um, Alice who's just joined. New reporters who've just joined are really, really good because they're desperate for stories. Um, I would just say, oh, hi, Alice. Uh, I just wondered if the news desk got my news release about Mental Health Awareness Week. We've got a couple of case studies up our sleeve. Um, give us a call if you don't know anything about this. And quite often that works. I had it with BBC Wiltshire. They contacted me about a news release I did send. And I sent them another one that I would had no response to. So I, I, when I got the person, an actual person talking to me, I just said, oh, by the way, Lucy, um, did you catch my news release I sent about blah de blah And she immediately came back and said, I haven't seen it. Can you send it again? Because things get lost when you've got a lot in a team. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, well, look, we, we've, we've run out of time, but, I, you know, I got in the last question. So does anyone have a, a final question they would like to ask Fiona? Fiona, it's been absolutely wonderful. It's, not, it's been much more than the PR and getting in the media. You've covered social media and uh, uh, just a, 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 a skim through uh, events and communications. So uh, absolutely massive thank you. I will share this video via our channels.